So hi guys, uh, you welcome to Mozi Academy and uh, in the continuation of our uh, and thermodynamics, we'll move to the topic of uh, thermal expansion. This thermal expansion, we are going to talk about uh, a couple of uh, topics under it with respect to the syllabus. Like I said, we are following the syllabus of uh, our country. And as a matter of fact, we are making sure that uh, everything that is required in the syllabus have been taken care of. So, and because of that, we take them one after the other. So please, the first part under the heat and thermodynamics was the kinetic theory of gas. The next one is thermal expansion. Then the last one should be its, its capacity and the rest. So we follow it in that sequence. So about our thermal expansion, we might have all studied in the early classes. It is just the fine of the expansion that is due to the rise in temperature we can just keep a note so that thermal expansion is, def is defined as the expansion due to rise in temperature and then then somewhat when we have a change in particular temperature of a particular substance the hour of that substance is going to be what expanded now when we talk about our thermal expansivity or thermal expansion which you have studied before we also talk about an important process we call thermal agitation. To understand thermal agitation, we can just take uh, a particular solid, like what I'm trying to do here, a solid substance. We have learned from our chemistry classes that solid substances are arranged in a particular pattern, which they form what lattice arrangement, which I believe we have all studied. So, and uh, if uh, as a result of increase in temperature, this is formation of lattice of solid, I'm considering a solid molecule inside the structure. So the moment there is a change in temperature or there is an increase in temperature, what we observe here is that what, there will be an increase in what? In random oscillation between the molecules which causes what we call thermal agitation. So the word thermal agitation can simply be defined as a kind of what? Random movement or random oscillation between solid particles that are arranged in lattice. So and thermal agitation is due to the formation of what we call thermal agitation in lattice. Now, there is a random oscillatory motion of particle with substance. Let's keep down a note, it's important. I say the random auxiliary auxiliary motion between molecular substance. Let's just the end of this between substances. It's called a time agitation. So this time agitation is due to what result of increase in temperature. So we say the energy required for what for random oxidative motion between particles or between molecular substance, that particular energy we call thermal agitation energy. So mathematically, we can conclude that uh, the thermal agitation energy, which I write as energy of thermal agitation, ETH, is proportional to a rise in temperature which I write temperature rise or theta T or basically let's write T for now. So this is the mathematical interpretation of what thermal agitation. So keep this one in, in, at the back of your mind. This is the way we express this uh, relationship mathematically. Now, having said that, my dear student, so what we are trying to say is that uh, when molecular substances are arranged in lattice, for example, like the example I have illustrated, we have something that is going to happen. There will be motion. The type of motion is random oxidatory motion, which is due to what agitation of what different, different what layers of the solid particles. They start moving and as they start moving, they will collide though with low velocity from your kinetic or from the study of what chemistry you have learned about the spaces in what the solid a little bit cramped. So my point is that uh, there is there are basically there are two things that got change or changes when it is applied to a substance. So we can just keep down another important note on that. So we can just write that uh, when it when it is applied 
or is supplied, let's use the right English, when it is supplied to a substance. When it is supplied to a substance, basically there are changes in, I said the first one, whenever you apply it to a substance, or it is being given to a substance, that we all call a change of phase. Change of phase. Or basically you say change of state. That is solid can turn to liquid. And when what liquid can turn to gases, that is change of state. And the second one, which we also need to keep in mind, there also be the what the rise what, or a change in temperature, the rising in temperature. So these two particular phenomena occur when it is being applied or supplied to a particular source. So when there's a rise in temperature, we say rise in temperature, we bring about thermal agitation. Thermal agitation energy, we cause random auxiliary motion. Auxiliary motion, we increase the stress between the intermolecular stress between the molecules that are actually reacting. When the molecules are stressed, they, they now start giving us spaces between them. When there are spaces between them, it will cause a change in dimension. When there is a change in dimension, dimensions such as length, area, and volume, when there is a change in dimension, we say that particular substance has been what has been what thermally what expanded. So to understand this process, let me help us to actually write it out in a systematic way in which if you are faced with some theoretical question to explain the toward thermal expansion according to the process, this is the systematic way we do that in what in what in classroom. So to explain that systematically, you can say systematically or let's say a systematically explanation. Systematically explanation. of thermal expansion, which I believe is very important for you guys to be mind. Now, like I said, you have to just keep up with it in here, very simple. We said it is supplied, it is supplied to a substance. As it is supplied to a substance, what happens is what? Let me change the coloration to red. Now we are increasing temperature, we rise. Temperature increase. When temperature increase, this is as a result of what we say, when there's a rise in temperature, there is what? There is increase in what? Thermal agitation energy also rise. You can also write that, that thermal agitation energy, ET, also what? Increases as the temperature increases. And when that happens, there will be random oxidation. The random oxidation will increase. Random oxidation will increase. So when random oxidation increase, then like I said, the intermolecular particles, intermolecular particles, or let's say interparticles, will be collision, like I said, particle collisions, we also increase as interparticle collision increase. The next thing is what you ask what the particles which are here will be stressed. So interparticle got stress. So the stress also increase interparticle stress increases. And as a result of increase in interparticle stress, what you expect, expect is what they what they what they will do what they will be stretched because they are stressed. So you expect separation should be the next separation between particles, separation between particles also increase. Then the next thing, excuse me, when so when the separation increases, then you are going to observe what dimension of substance there will be a change in dimensions. I will say change in dimensions. 
example of good dimensions we talk about is the length. The length changes. We say the area changes. And we also say the volume changes. So, so they, they will also change in dimension. What we mean by that is what dimensions also what got what increased. And when dimension got increased, so we say the process that has occurred is now called what? Tama. Tama expansion. So this is the systematic way we use to explain the what the change in what in what in what in the temperature or the change in what in the physical property of a substance when there is a change in what in temperature, which we call what thermal expansion. So this is the way we do it, and this is the way we analyze the explanation. The most important thing we are studying this slide is that what thermal agitation will bring about what random oscillation, and uh, when random oscillation occurs, the next thing you expect is what collision will take place. When they collide, there will be stress. When they stressed, there will be space. When there are spaces, dimensions will change. And when dimension changes, the process that occurs called thermal. So when it is applied to a substance, there will be a change in temperature. And when there is a change in temperature, the effect of that change in temperature as a result of this literally two process I have explained will call what thermal expansion. So I hope students understand this. And this is the way we explain thermal expansion. In what in our junior process. So we move to the next chapter. Fine. In continuation to what we have, continuation to what we have, still on the topic of thermal expansion, the next thing we want to talk about is what we call temperature. Now, in our early classes or junior classes, we have learned a lot about temperature. In fact, we define temperature as the measure of what we say the degree of hotness and coldness. Let's just write the degree. of oddness and uh, coldness of a body. Now, from our previous slide, we have actually what also defined them, but we can also define temperature with respect to what we discussed in our previous slide. That is talking about in terms of the thermal thermal agitation. Now, about that, we can say the measure of energy of what? The, the measure of the energy of what the randomness or energy of random oscillation can also be defined as temperature because we said when temperature is, is being increased, there will be thermal agitation. And when there's thermal agitation, the words, there will be what change in what there will be random motion or oscillatory motion between what molecular particles. So you can also define temperature as the measure, another way for a more advanced way the measure of uh, the the measure of the energy of uh, random oscillation of a body of particles. Now, and from early classes, we know that uh, the measure of temperature is carried out by what we call what a thermometer. So for a system of body, if we want to measure temperature, we should keep a note to that. Now to measure temperature, sorry guys, to measure temperature, we measure some physical properties, some physical properties, that changes with temperature. I hope all students still remember this stuff that you have studied in your junior classes. Now, when we want to measure the temperature of a substance, we use a thermometer, fine. Now, in some cases, to actually measure the temperature, we measure the physical property that also varies with temperature. Now, some of the words, when we have system of bodies, which varies with temperature. We have a lot of example. I will only talk about the important one. Example includes sometimes you measure what we call the length of a substance. So as the length of a substance, you can also measure the area or the volume of a substance. All these parameters which I have listed are physical properties that can easily change with temperature. 
Another thing we can also measure, if we don't want to measure that, is they can also measure what we call the pressure of a gas. The pressure of a gas also varies with temperature of a gas. We also measure refractive index because refractive index also varies with temperature. So we guys, refractive index of a substance can also be measured, which also give us the value of the change in temperature. Another thing is what resistance of wire. Resistance of wire. The resistance of a of particular substance can also be measured as a physical property that tells us the increase in what in temperature. And when we talk about one, I can give another one, which is uh, you have, you have uh, electromotive force, EMF, and so on and so forth. So basically, in your junior classes, the measure of temperature, which is measured by thermometer for a body, but when we have system of bodies, we also use some physical property, which we measure directly. And on top of them, we now calibrate a scale. As we calibrate a scale in between that particular physical properties, so as those physical properties increase, and when we supply it, we can easily read the temperature of that substance. And this is the way most, excuse me, most of your thermometer are uh, being what measured or are being made in what in what in real life. So a very good example to understand better what I'm talking about, because I believe you are you should have studied most of this in. Um, your early classes or your junior classes. Now, be that as it may, we can just say this science, the science of measurement, science of measurement, the science of measurement of uh, temperature is called thermometry, thermo. Metric. So, because this is the way it has been written in your syllabus, and we should discuss about thermometric properties. Now, now, when we talk about thermometric properties and the instruments we use for measure, I hope students still remember is what thermo thermometer, which I believe you all still have an idea of. So, there are a lot of thermometer which you must have studied in your junior classes. So the basic example of the thermometer we talk about is the what we call the mercury. Mercury in glass thermometer. If a mercury in glass thermometer, I told you we measure the temperature as a result of the expansion of mercury. Mercury is written as H in what inside the glass. So as the what as the mercury expand, the expansion of that mercury inside the glass makes us to measure the what the change in temperature of that particular substance. So these particular properties that we measure, this physical property that we measure and that actually rise as the increase in temperature are now what they call thermometric properties, which I believe you have also studied in your early classes. Maybe we keep a note for understanding sake. So those physical properties, or you say the physical properties, the physical properties, that changes with a change in temperature is called thermometric dot. Which I have given example of those properties was like pressure of the gas. Property like resistance of wire refractive index of a gas, that like lens, like area and volume. So this explanation I will just give you for understanding sake for you to understand how mercury and glass work. Another example of another type of thermometer apart from mercury and glass is uh, what we call pressure thermometer that make use of a gas pressure. So as the pressure increases, towards the temperature also increases, then we calibrate it and measure pressure in gas. I would say pressure thermometer. So pressure thermometer. So that's another example. Another good example is resistance thermometer. And we measure the resistance thermometer and so on and so forth. So the way they work is just talking about the change in what this change in resistance 
change in the pressure, change in what the expansion, the length, the expansion of mercury. A very good one example to that, maybe if I can just manage the space here, is to have uh, something like a, a thermometer like this. I'm trying to draw a very good example of it, which is having a bulb here. Inside that particular bulb, we fill in what the mercury in it. So the mercury is filling it such that uh, the size of the water, this is the mercury, which is filled, and the side of this particular thing is now calibrated so that we can measure the scale. So the equation is when the temperature is increased here, as temperature is increased in the bulb here, it enters through this liquid, the liquid will rise and fall, as the liquid rises, then we measure the temperature state. So this is the method we are talking about. That there are some particular, I'll we'll talk about system of bodies. Instead of us measuring temperature directly, what we measure is just what these other physical properties which we have measured, and those properties that changes with change in temperature is called what thermometric property. And the science of the measure of temperature is called what thermometric. I hope students still understand. The same thing occurs to pressure. Instead of us measuring what the temperature scale directly, we measure the pressure of the gas that is used. So in early classes, junior classes, I, I believe you have studied, a lot of cases, you know, it can be mercury in glass. Sometimes we use what alcohol. So, so that's how we also talk about uh, some of the junior, excuse me, guys, as we still have a long way to go. So that is why we are trying to make sure everything is working according to plan. So now my point is uh, mercury can be in glass alcohol can be in there. So they have advantages and disadvantages. I'm not going to talk on that one, but I can just give you one of the reasons why mercury is preferred as a thermometric liquid. For example, if somebody asks what is thermometric liquid, they are liquids or what that's what changes with what change in temperature. Anything thermometric is a physical property of substance that changes with a change in temperature. So if you have been asked what thermometric liquid stands for, simply means those substances that changes with a rise in temperature. And that is the definition we give to it in physics. So be that as it may, the next point here I'm trying to explain to us here is that in case of mercury in glass, why is mercury preferred to alcohol and alcohol preferred to mercury? Now, mercury is preferred to work in a glass thermometer because it's what it's 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 it's, it's expand uniform expansion because it expands. In fact, I can tell you out of all type of thermometer, for example, a type of pressure thermometer, you guys know thermocouple. You know, you know there are a lot of examples. Thermocouple, we have a uh, resistant wire resistant thermometer liquid in glass, the way that we break it down for you in junior classes, which can be mercury or alcohol. Mercury is preferred to alcohol because it expands uniformly. So it expands even more than the gas, any gas. Mercury, mercury in glass is even more accurate than even the pressure thermometer. So by and large, in a nutshell, to actually face what we have to face, mercury expands more than alcohol. Thereby, why you can see alcohol is also preferred to mercury is because a good thermometer must have a low freezing point. And alcohol has a low freezing point. So these are little, little terms you can keep at the back of the lines, which will definitely help you to understand the importance of liquid and glass thermometer. So I hope you understand that pressure thermometer. I told you, you have a lot of thermocouple. You know, you know about thermocouple and you know about thermostats. Thermostats are found in iron. Thermocouples are when you talked about two dissimilar metal, copper and constantan. Don't worry about this. I know you have studied that in your junior classes. So this is just the summary of that. And that in continuation, before we move to the next slide, because temperature is very important. And uh, the major, the last thing I will talk about here is uh, how we work different temperature scale, which I think is also very, very important for you to know. So about the last part, we have different temperature scales. So the different temperature, because most of your numerical questions are going to fall on this part. So, so we'll talk about what different temperature. So to define temperature scale, we use two particular fixed points. So we use it to define temperature. So in physics, we use two fixed points. 
there are two fixed points that is used as a measure of temperature scale. So the two fixed points are called the steam point and the ice point, or you say the ice and the steam point. In junior classes, you might have studied the name of the instrument that is used for measuring the ice and steam point. The instrument is called an IPSO, IPSOmeter. So students can be careful about some direct question, uh, multiple choice question, which can ask you about instruments for measuring temperature is thermometer, instruments for measuring the water temperature scale, which is majorly the highs and steam point is what also matter. So in chemistry, I'm sorry, in physics. Now in physics, when we talk about ice point and steam point, the ice point and, and, and steam point of different temperature scales varies from one point to another. So, and we have five major temperature scales to then need to keep in mind as an advanced student. In a low, low level student, only need to put maybe two or three in mind, which is Celsius, Fahrenheit, and uh, the last one, which they call thermodynamic, which is Kelvin state. So, but for us that we are advanced students in our colleges and institutions, you talk about five major scale of what measurement of temperature. So, and the way we measure temperature, there is an absolute way, theoretical way, we use to measure the value of what the high and steam point with temperature, which is also applicable to all types of thermometer. So the randomized uh, pattern we use, sorry, excuse me, guys, for measure temperature scale, we also, we, for measuring temperature scale, so temperature scale measurements is always given in this form. This is always in terms of temperature reading minus the ice point We divide that by the steam point minus the ice point. And this must always be constant for all scale. It must always be constant for all scale. So I hope we, are, we have come across something like this before. And this is the method some of you are used to drawing and doing relationship of your issue to get answer, it is still the same thing because you have always you have only followed the method of measurement of temperatures, which is always the reading minus ice point, the steam point minus ice point, and so on and so forth. So this type of uh, this type of uh, measurement or this type of formula which we use to solve this is called thermometric standard word scale or thermometric standard what unit. So this is the formula we use to measure what different temperature scale. So before we move to the next slide, maybe we should talk about the five important temperature scale that is needed for all students to keep at the back of your mind. Because if you don't have this at the back of your mind, it's going to harm you. I know what I'm saying. Then we'll take one example if what we needed it. So about that, wow. So about that, we can just, just look into this. I want to make a rule. I want to rule this size when I will have space to consider the five major temperature scale. Now, about the five major temperature scale, which I believe we might have studied in our early classes, the five major temperature scales are, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, the five are uh, the first one. Let's just take it in form of a table, like uh, symbols. Ice points. I will write ice point as IP and steam point as SP. So let's take the first one, which we call Celsius. Celsius. I hope my, my spelling is correct. Celsius scale, the symbol is written as degree specific. The ice point is zero degrees Celsius, and the steam point is 100 degrees Celsius. The next type of scale is the Kelvin scale. Kelvin scale. The Kelvin scale is taken as a, this is written as a Kelvin K. It's not degree Kelvin. 
ice point is 273.14, but approximately you use 273. It's 273 Kelvin, 0.14 Kelvin. Then this is a 373.14 Kelvin, approximately 373, which we call the thermal dynamic scale. So the next one after that is uh, what we call the Fahrenheit scale, excuse me. Fahrenheit scale. About the Fahrenheit scale is, is written as a degree Fahrenheit. Degree Fahrenheit. This is degree Celsius, not necessarily degree Celsius. Degree Fahrenheit. And the ice point is 32. The steam point is 212 degree Fahrenheit. Let's put that there. The next one is the remote scale, remote scale, which is written as degree remote. Ah. So ice point is zero degree remote and system point is 80 degree remote. And the fifth one, which I said, I said there are five major scale is called Rankine scale, Rankine scale. And then some of you are not used to all this, but you just have to keep it in mind. It is denoted by RA. Then this is our uh, ice point is 460 Rankine RA. And steam point is 672 Rankine. So now this is the way and the methodology we use in physics when we talk about the scale of what? the scale of what the measurement of temperature. So we can quickly just do one for understanding. Say, let's say we want to convert Fahrenheit scale to Celsius scale. Fahrenheit scale to Celsius scale. So the Celsius scale we want to convert is constant. So we can say degree Celsius minus ice point, you can see, which is what you always need. Ice point of this one is a zero. Ice point of Celsius, you can see, is zero all over steam point of Celsius is 100 minus zero is equals to, we are moving from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So Fahrenheit, ice point of Fahrenheit is uh, ice Fahrenheit uh, 32 minus zero, you can see 32 minus zero over, oh, oh I said 32. So temperature reading, sorry, should be, sorry about that. So that is a degree Fahrenheit. That is degree Fahrenheit minus zero over steam point is 212 minus 32. So if we go by that, Solving this one now without wasting now, this is like saying C over 100 is equals to, this is F over, I think this should be 180. If I'm not mistaken, this is the grief area, it is the degree Celsius. So if I cut and make this subject of formula, I know this should be five, this should be nine. 20, 20 can go in 105 times. I hope students are following, and it can go here nine times. So if we cross multiply, you can see we say degree for anyone you want to make sort of formula. You have nine degree Fahrenheit is equals to five degrees Celsius, whatever. So when you cross multiply. So now if I make degree Fahrenheit sort of formula, I can say degree Fahrenheit, and degree is too big. <laughs> so we have degree Fahrenheit, is equals to, this is five over nine. So five over nine, then times our uh, degree Celsius plus 32. So this is the way we do stuff like this, which is quite easy to understand. And if we have any issues with that, we can all lose those. We can always uh, convert. Sorry, I think we made a mistake in our scale given the temperature we are measuring is this is this. Then the ice point of Fahrenheit is 32. So this should be 32. So this is minus 32. 
So please note that. So this is 32, which is the ice So this is the way we use the formula. So what I've done here now, I try to make what this subject of formula. So this is direct formula. You can always use if you want to convert from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius. So if it is degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, it is just opposite of this to be uh, we have a degree Celsius, we just be reverse of this should be nine over five times the degree Fahrenheit plus 32, which I have only gotten from what my relationship. So if I have a relationship of the temperature of this one, I will just substitute the value, then I will get my answer in Celsius. So in this case, I'm just trying to bring up the value. For example, if somebody asks me to convert 20 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. So what I would just do from my direct formula of working from this relationship, I can say nine over five times, uh, okay, 20 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. Sorry, this is degrees Celsius, sorry about that. And this is Fahrenheit. On my subject of formula, there's an error. And this is degree Fahrenheit towards two degrees Celsius. You can do that by cross multiplying and seeing what I've done. I've not done something that is uh, too big for you to understand. So, or directly, you can just put the values directly here. Yeah, converting 20 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. So, so what I have is from what for so Fahrenheit scale to be nine over five times 20 plus 32. So, which if I follow directly, it should give me the right answer. That would be nine over five, and see, times uh, 20 plus 32. So from your mathematics, five year one, five year four, four times nine is at 36, 36 plus 32 will be equals to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So a measure of 68 degrees Fahrenheit is the same thing as 20 degrees Celsius. So if you have 68 degrees Fahrenheit, you want to come back to Celsius, you use five over nine times this. So you can memorize, but you don't even need to memorize directly from formula 20 degrees Celsius is what you want. So you know how to do that. Just put that in this value 20 over 100, F minus 32, 20 minus 32, then cross multiply, you have the answer as you I hope you understand this. And that is all about temperature. So in this slide, we talked about temperature as a measure of openness and coolness of the body. We also define it in terms of thermal agitation as the measure of energy of random rotation of the body of particles. So we say to measure temperature, we measure some physical properties like length, area, and volumes. Sometimes we measure resistance and so on and so forth. We say the science of measurement of temperature is thermometry. Instruments we use to measure temperature is thermometer. And having said that, we also talk about uh, properties, those properties that changes with change in temperature as what we call thermometric properties. There are some liquids that view like that. We call them thermometric liquid. We list type of thermometer and we talk about how they work. And we also talk about different scales. We say we have five basic scales with Celsius, Kelvin, Fahrenheit, Rimo, and Rankine. So what you need to keep in mind is just the ice point and steam point. Always use the temperature scale formula, which is said, said to be the reading minus the ice point over the steam point minus the ice point is always going to be constant. So we try to do that by manipulating or by saying manipulating, deriving formula by putting values. And we have formulas to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit and so on and so forth. So this is the way we do that. And this is all what you needed to know at temperature. I think we move to the next section. Yes, about the next section, my dear students, we are getting there. It is our types of thermal expansion. And about what we have discussed, we said the dimension, when substances is heated, we expect a lot of things to change. And one of those things that we change when substances are heated is what it should be thermally expanded. So in basically in elementary class, in your junior classes, we say we have three types of thermal expansion. Let us make a rule. ruler. Let's rule the place where we have a space for enough work and other things. So now there are basically there are three types of thermal expansion. The first one we call linear expansion. Which is basically based in increase in the length of the substance. The second type of expansion we call superficial expansion. Which is based in area. 
or the change in area of the substance. And the light type of expansion we might have studied in early classes is cubical expansion, which basically based in changing works in volume. In fact, basically, when we talk about cubic expansion, it only occurs in what in what in gases. So please note that for whereas a uh, linear expansion and superficial expansion, we have liquids and gases. So now, as a matter of what we have studied, uh, we are going to be considering each of these type of expansion one by one. And to start with, we are going to start with the first one, which is a linear expansion. To understand the concept of linear expansion, we are going to be considering a rod. I just want to draw a rod. So we're going to, we said the type of expansion that's in what increases as an increase in what as a result of change in length. So we have a rod. Diagram not down to scale. Loss management, but that is that can never be a rod. Sorry about my diagram. So just manage my rod, guys. The rod I'm drawing is not making sense at all. So we have a rod, rod of initial length of L. Let me change to a blue ink. The length of the rod is L. Now, it is fixed at one end anyway. First, so this is the part in which the rod is fixed. So that when we increase the temperature, now I increase the temperature of this rod from T1 to T2. Most of you are used to theta 1 to theta 2. Guys, we are talking about the same thing. Increasing the temperature from theta 1 to because it is fixed, when the temperature of this is increased, we have talked about what will happen. Then this thing we get what we got expanded. Only one side is expanding because what I have fixed the other side. I hope you understand. So now this length has changed from L to what we call a new length, which was change in length. That data simply means the change in length. Having said that, the next thing that will happen here is what we can now say the change in temperature here, because the temperature has been increased. It's just what the final temperature, which is T2 minus the initial temperature, which is T1. So now we can actually list some physical property that actually make this particular expansion to occur. And if you want to list that, you can say this material, this change in length, which is a delta L, increases because of what is proportional to the initial length, because of increase in length, because if this what if the is what if the length of this thing is longer, we expect what the expansion of what the change in length to also increase. So we change we say the change in length of this rod is proportional to what to the initial length of this, as we know that there will be some agitation, agitation between the which we call random oscillatory motion, which we have discussed earlier. Now, having said that, the next thing we also need to keep in mind is what it's not only that the change in length. Is also proportional to the change in temperature, which we call, I'll write that change in temperature as theta 2. Which is also very, very important. So there are two particular things that are caused here. The length has changed because of the initial length. The new length has also what changed because of what changed in temperature. So from another of mathematics, we can combine these together so we can say, Change in length is now proportional to like a joint variation of L change in temperature. So we introduce a constant. So we say change in length is now equals to alpha L change in temperature. This alpha that you guys are seeing here is now what we call the coefficient. The coefficient of linear expansion, the coefficient of linear expansion. So well, this is the formula you keep at the back of your mind. You can use this formula directly because in some question, they can ask you directly to calculate the change in length of a particular substance. And to calculate the change in length of that substance, you can just find what, if the length is changing, so just the word coefficient of linear expansion multiplied by the what? By the length itself, 
multiplied by the change in temperature, which is always given in terms of what? The final temperature minus the initial temperature. I hope students understand that. Also, we can remodify this formula, which is the famous formula you see, right? As uh, the final length of this rod. So let me say L final on the standing state is now the sum of initial one plus the final one, which is the tire. And see the final length, the load has extended from L to the tire. So the total length now is now L plus the tire. So I won't say that. So we can say the final length is now equals to to substitute our theta L value plus, uh, as you can see, alpha L change in temperature. So when we now factorize, we take the final length is now equals to L is common. We have a one plus alpha change in temperature, which is another important formula. You can also keep in mind, my dear students, which you can also use directly in case the question asks you to find the new or the final word. The final length when the particular word or substance has been increased. So these are ways in which what the direct formula we use directly for numerical case, which we are still going to use under the illustration section of the study. So in continuation, my dear students, we talk about the second one. And about the second one, we talk about superficial expansion. Now about superficial expansion, let us take this slide. We so said are, these are the expansion that is due to the change in what in area. So, so when it is being entered, there will be a change in area. So to understand that, let us consider a box. I think that would be the best option for us here. A box of initial length L. Now initial length of L and initial breadth of uh, B. We know from, I'm talking this is a rectangle, the area, the initial area, area initial, initial area of this length is, uh, of this box is length times breadth, which we all know. So let's say by expansion, let's say by expansion, this has increased when the temperature increases the, The breadth increases, and because of the breadth has increased, the length also increases. When the temperature increases, when we increase the temperature of this body. And as a result of that, this was how this is the new dimension we are having. I am not going to scale. So now, so now in this case, now we have a Increase this thing now, it has increased from length from L to delta L, just like what we have talked about. You can see two things are changing here, and breadth has increased from this to delta B, which you can see. So we can say because of that, the final area of this thing will now change. The final area will now be equal to now from what we have studied, from what we have studied, the length of this thing has increases from you can see. From what with the final length will now be the initial length is like at one plus. So the length has increased now to now be L into bracket. I'm just using that directly. One plus alpha change in temperature multiplied by the breadth, which has increased to data B2, to now be B open bracket, one plus alpha change in what in temperature. This is the length of the two that has increased. So area is length times breadth. The new length is now one plus alpha and breadth into like a one plus alpha change in temperature. I said the temperature has increased from T to T plus delta T or to delta T directly. So now from here, we can take it from there. So initial area is LB. So we can see LB. So we can say the final area, our right final area is A final, which is just a good way. You now we because look at L times B. What was L times? That is initial area. I'll take initial area as A naught. So initial area I'm taking as A naught. LB here, LB here is this. So we have two things that we have here. We have a open bracket, one plus alpha delta T raised to power two. You can see this times this is raised to power two. Now we need to understand something here. Now for a very, very low value of for alpha delta T, 
that is less than one or very, very less than one. So we can use our knowledge of binomial expansion in mathematics. In binomial expansion, let me give you a quick recap. If we have one plus x raised to the power of n, now in this case, if x is very, very less than one from binomial expansion, this expansion is the same thing as one plus what? Nx. That is the methodology we use in binomial expansion. We use this to solve a lot of mathematical problems. So alpha delta t is very, very less than one. So the knowledge of what binomial expansion will work. And how does it work? So we say the final area will be equals to the initial area, open bracket, one plus uh, two. My two always look like alpha, this is two. Then we have uh, alpha delta t. I have followed the knowledge of what binomial expansion. Now, this two alpha delta t is another thing we need to understand. So because we said the which we now be right as final area is equals to initial area open bracket one plus beta delta t now this beta you have seen here is a definition which is given to what we call the coefficient coefficient of superficial expansion superficial so you keep that in mind. It's very, very important. So, and by doing so, what we have said here is that that means, you know, we have substituted this two alpha to be equals to beta. So you keep in mind that what superficial expansion, which we call some people call area expansivity, is equals to two times, I said my two is always like what linear expansivity is another good formula you might use in what your numerical calculation with time. So in continuation, in sequence to that, let's talk about the third one, which is what we call Kubica expansion. Kubica expansion. About Kubica expansion, a quick, when we talk about Kubica expansion, we are talking about the type of what expansion that is with change in what in volume of a substance. So if we talk about volume of a substance, let us consider a cubic shape, or a cubic whatever, so we have this. So let's just this before we move to the next slide. Wow. So trying to do that. So now we have uh, the length, the breadth, and the height, which we have studied before in our early classes. Just for us to understand this. So from what we have understand, initial volume, initial volume is a length times breadth times height. So from what I've said, each of them will increase, the length will increase towards, because of increase in temperature, a bit, when the temperature increase from, uh, we increase the temperature to the 30, we, we study each of these, we increase. Length we increase to what? L into bracket one plus alpha delta T. B we increase from what? B into bracket one plus alpha delta T. H we increase to what? H what? Into bracket one plus alpha delta T. So without the center, we are going to have uh, the final volume will be equals to the initial volume, which is our LBH, which is the initial volume into bracket one plus alpha delta T raised to power three. Just a direct illustration here. So initial volume is, that is VF is equals to, here we have, this is initial volume, I'll call V naught into bracket from binomial expansion, what I told you, one plus three alpha change in temperature. So we are going to define another property, which I think we just need to continue in the next slide. Now, about the next slide to the court, to define this property very well, and for understanding sake, because we are not rushing anywhere, we have to understand this conceptually. So from where we stopped, we say that the final volume is equals to the initial volume into bracket one plus three alpha change in temperature. So which is from binomial expansion, which I have explained. So this three alpha is now defined in terms of another property we call coefficient of cubic expansion. This is one plus, we now change this one to what? Gamma. This is gamma alpha 
that are very important for you to keep in mind. So this gamma is defined as a, the coefficient of cubic expansion. Coefficient. Of a cubic cube or cubic expansion, which is also very, very important for us to keep in mind. So, the definition we give to this here is that uh, we say gamma is equal to three, three alpha. So, gamma is equal to three alpha, very important also to keep in mind. So, so this relationship can be set in different ways. Remember, we say beta is equal to. 2 alpha, my tree is always like alpha, 2 alpha, then gamma is equals to 3 alpha. So you can relate gamma and beta together. So that is 3 beta over alpha. How did I come about that? That is just a little bit of mathematics, nothing more is the pretentious. So if beta is equals to 2 alpha and gamma is equals to 3 alpha, so you can say here, yeah, you can make alpha square formula. What's this? Alpha is equals to beta by 2. My two is always like that. So when you substitute that, you have gamma is equals to three beta by two, as you can see. So sometimes if you are given this and you want to guess oh, which is in that three by two beta. So that's another way you can use it directly to, some, to solve some numerical. In fact, some theoretical questions, sorry, multiple choice question, ask directly this relationship. So guys, that is that about the three types of our Expansion. So the last one I'll talk about, which we call what is called the variation in density, which is also very important. Variation in density of the substance. Variation in density of a substance. Now, from early classes, we have studied uh, a density of a substance, which we denote by rho is equal to the mass of the substance over volume. What that means from early, early classes is that uh, when what when the density of a substance is what is, but when the volume of the substance is increased, the density of that substance will be called reduced. So and to understand that, we can take an example, a very good example we can put into consideration is uh, looking into a very, very rough substances. Let me just try to draw something that is rough. So which was heated? This thing has a volume, initial volume of V. I just take this into consideration. This is initial volume of V. Then when it was expanded, that is when it was heated, the volume of the substance will increase and it has increased from V to what? You know what we talk to data V. So let's say this is the final volume of this. We call this final. And this is because what? Remember the mass of this thing is what is constant. Mass does not change. We've talked about that time and time again. So mass of the substance is constant. Only the temperature, we have increased the temperature of the substance. And that is why we have that. So without wasting time, we will represent density by rho. Please, rho, please note that or understand this. Thing. So in continuation to that, just for you to understand, because many times we are going to be faced with this, word, this relationship. So from here, we say the final, the initial, I will take that one, the initial density that is rho i is equals to mass over what? Over initial volume, which I will take as V. Now, the final volume, I will take that one as rho f. This is rho, you can see I'm bending it a little bit, excuse me. So we be equal to the mass, mass is the same thing over the final volume. And you know, the final volume will change from what we have studied here. The final volume, which is Vf, we change to be equals to, you can see this is the methodology that we use. That is a V naught, open bracket, one plus gamma change in what temperature. So if we substitute that there, we are going to have a, that is a rho F is equals to the mass over, you can see this is initial volume, open bracket, I'm substituting the parameter here, excuse me, one plus gamma change in temperature. And if I've done that, remember that the initial volume, which I take as V naught here, initial volume here is uh, equals to mass over V naught. So if I do that, you can see mass over V naught, we now make my expression to be the final density rho will now be equals to, you can see, 
m over v naught is the initial. So I'll write it as p initial. That is rho, it's not p, p or rho initial over then the value we have here. This and this is rho initial. Then we have one plus gamma change in temperature. So if I have done that, this is the expression we use for the variation of density, which students can also keep at the back of their mind. But there is something we also need to put in mind. Yeah. This is the expression we use for some numerical application when density of a substance is change is changing when it is being heated. So we use the final density is equal to initial density over one plus the amount change in temperature. But there yeah, is other things students need to keep at the back of their mind here. Yeah. So that they don't make a mistake. There are some other important things we need to have at the back of our And one of the most important things you need to keep in mind here is that the density we are talking about is when there are conditions. Listen, when, let me just write, I will stop now. When gamma delta t is very, very less than one, or is less than one, don't mind me, I'm used to very, very less than something. When gamma delta t is less than one, the expression we use, if this is less than one, we say the final, just say it should be, the final is not equals to the initial, that is P initial into bracket one plus gamma delta T raised to power minus one. So in some numerical question, they will tell you the value of what? Increase in what gamma delta t is less than one, it's very, very less than one. So, this is the expression with which you can remodify from your early classes. This is the same thing as you know, this is in one over. So, and if you write that one as one over, it will now from binomial expansion. I told you it begins to p final is now equals to p initial open bracket one minus gamma delta t from what we've studied. So, this expression is also very, very important. For understanding state, and that is why, excuse me, that is why we are talking about this. So please, in calculations, when you are faced with questions that uh, you are dealing with change in density of a substance when it has been heated, and uh, you are considering that particular substance in terms of the gamma delta T, which is very, very low, we consider the formula, this second formula is what we use. But if the value of what gamma delta T is not low, we use the first formula. So you can always keep this one for, this is only applicable for only small value, only small values of uh, gamma delta T. So keep it in mind because most of the time, many times students will ask me, sir, in the previous solution, you used the first and now you are using the second. The reason is because what I just explained to you guys now. The simple reason is because of what the value of what gamma delta. So when there is a variation, when there is a change in density of a substance as a result of change in heat or as a result of change in temperature, the formula we use is what P final is initial one plus gamma change in temperature or P final is P initial one minus gamma change in temperature, the, depending on the, the values of what gamma delta. So I hope you students understand these and the important formulas which I have bring or ticked are those ones you have to keep at the back of your mind in case of numerical questions. So I think we, we talked a lot on this slide. On this slide, we talked about uh, different types of uh, expansivity. We started by talking directly on the three major types, which are linear expansion, which talks about variation in length. We talked about superficial expansion, which talked about variation in area. And we talked about cubical expansion, which talks about uh, the change in water volume. So we try to derive the formula. We said you can be asked to find the change in length directly, just put alpha L change in temperature. Or in the other way, you can use the final temperature is initial, open a bracket one plus gamma, oh, sorry, alpha change in temperature. Alpha is defined as the coefficient of linear expansion. We talk about the superficial, which is also for area expansion in your junior classes. So from that, we said we use the binomial expansion in determination of the formula. And having done that, we have a, another parameter with coefficient of superficial expansion, and that one is equals to two times that of linear coefficient. So we also talked about the cubic expansion, which talks about volume. We define another property, which we call a coefficient of cubic expansion, which varies with three times of coefficient of linear expansion. So all these are being talked about, and we talked about also the duration in density. We relate the linear expansion coefficient, superficial, 
and also the Ghana expansion. Having done that, we talked about population density. We gave two cases in terms of gamma delta t less than one, and a situation whereby gamma delta t is what is not less than one. The formula varies, and the two formulas are final is equal to initial one plus gamma delta over one plus gamma and initial one minus gamma change in temperature. So this is what we talked about this time. Understanding matters, application of formula will be discussed in the what in the full core class. This is the concept. Then we move to the what to the next slide. About the next slide we have apparent expansion of liquid. <laughs> About apparent expansion of liquid for understanding sake, maybe I should make a ruler. I should rule this page for us to have a, a longer stop. I hope we are getting all this because understanding is very, very important in physics. Now, about apparent uh, expansion. Now, when we talk about apparent expansion, we are talking about what the change or the increase in the system of what when we are talking about uh, a situation whereby the change in expansion between two substances. So students need to understand this. So understand this concept very well. Maybe I should draw a container and from that container, maybe I should fill that container up with a liquid. For us to understand the concept of apparent expansion. So this is a container. I hope students can see the container. So this is this I'm trying to draw. And inside that container, container is sealed up, is filled to the brim with water. So if we have water inside the container, let's say this is the water, and the water is filled up to the brain, please, just for illustration sake and understanding sake of apparent expansion. So if this is filled to the brain, as you can see, so now, there, are, there is liquid inside this container, liquid expansion. We talk about volume expansion, expansivity. So about this, guys, uh, the container. This is the container. The container is we expand immediately. We have what we supply it. Please note that. So let's say the coefficient of expansion of this liquid here is taken as gamma L. And for the container, I'm taking that one as what? as gamma C, the coefficient of what, of what, of expansion of the container, I'm taking as gamma C. The container is in green, the liquid is what is in red. And that is why I use two different volumes. So let's say the initial volume of this thing, because when we talk about uh, liquids, we talk about volume expansion, or cubic expansion. So the initial volume of this, of this container, the space occupied by an object is called volume, is taken as V. From uh, what we have studied, we say, we consider the two one by one. I want you to understand what they call apparent expansion. That is why I'm trying to do simple experiment to explain these in details. So about this, my dear students. So let's start with um, volume of the liquid. The volume of the liquid, the final volume of the liquid, will be the initial volume of the liquid. Open bracket from what we have studied in the previous lesson. One plus gamma L. That is coefficient of liquid uh, of uh, of the liquid. Coefficient of expansion of the liquid and change in temperature. I've changed this temperature. I've, I've heated up this thing. I don't need to be telling you everything, but this is heated up. So when it is supplied, what happens? The temperature will definitely change. So this is for this. So the same thing happened to the container. If we want to get the what the volume of the container, the final volume of the container when it was heated, to be the volume of the, the initial volume of the liquid, we open the bracket one plus the cubic expansivity coefficient of the container as gamma C, then a change in temperature. I hope students, my students understand this because I'm only comp comparing two things for us to understand what we call what. So these are the final volumes of what? Final volumes of uh, both the liquid and that of the container. Now from understanding from experiments, which I have also talked about, we know that what? Liquid will expand more than solids. You should know that liquid expand more than solids. Chat. Sorry about that, about the writing. Liquids expand more than solid. And because of that, more than solids. And because of that, we can say the coefficient of what? The coefficient of uh, 
expansivity of liquid is greater than that of the container. So as this thing is being heated up, it will expand. After expansion, you start seeing some amount of liquid will be overflowing. So we call that volume overflow. As a result of it, we say volume overflow. Trying to make sure all concepts are cleared without any atom of what of doubt. Now, the volume overflow is talking about differences between the volume of the liquid and that of the container. So this particular volume overflow, we can now say we subtract volume overflow. Let me write volume overflow is now equals to, we say the volume of the liquid minus the volume of the container. So if we do that mathematically, we have volume of the liquid is our V naught, open bracket one plus gamma L, change in temperature. We are subtracting that from volume of the container is V naught, open bracket one plus gamma C, change in temperature. So if we have done that, what we are going to have here from what we have, which is the volume over flow, will now be equals to V naught is a constant parameter. Here we are going to have a open bracket gamma L minus gamma C, close the bracket, change in temperature. So this gamma L minus gamma C is now defined as the apparent or that's a coefficient now because it is coefficient now, coefficient of apparent expansion. Coefficient of apparent expansion due to the container. So now the volume overflow, so we define gamma L minus gamma C as that. So volume overflow, which is volume will be overflow, I'm just using a mathematical illustration will now be equals to V naught. So gamma L minus gamma C is now written as a apparent cubic expansion. That is a coefficient of apparent expansion that delta T. So this particular expression or illustration that you have seen there, which we call gamma apparent, that is coefficient of apparent expansion, is now equals to the coefficient of what? That is a liquid minus the coefficient of what? Container. So this, the way we define apparent expansion, coefficient of apparent expansion is always equals to coefficient of what? Of what? Of the liquid. That is a, it's a cubical coefficient of what? Of the liquid minus that of the container. So this is the definition we give to what? apparent expansion, that is when liquid expands more than solid. So the difference between the coefficient of cubic expansion of liquid minus the coefficient of what? Of that of the container. So in this, most of the time, some of you are used to seeing the formula as um, you say real cubic expansivity, which is basically what you guys are used to. I know what you are, which is the liquid. When you make this sort of formula, it's now equals to apparent expansivity plus, as you can see, what I did here, this is here, I'm moving this to the, was that of the container. So this one is now called the real cubic expansivity. Real cubic expansivity. This is apparent cubic expansivity, and this is called cubical expansivity. So this is the methodology we use. So that is just the difference between the liquid itself, which is the cubic expansion, minus the what are uh, the, the the that of what the, the, the container container that is holding the liquid. So this is the definition we give to it, and this is the relationship which is also very very important in solving some questions in physics about apparent expansion and real expansion. So we say real expansion equals to apparent expansion from the work plus gamma. So majority of time, most of you guys are familiar with uh, gamma R, 
is equals to gamma a plus gamma. So this is the expression which we use to derive the formula. And this is how we use it. So keep it in mind. In fact, from Hope's experiment, apparent expansion, which I believe you've done in your junior classes, apparent expansion is given from experiment as a mass of mass expelled. Let me just help out. Mass expelled, just a quick repetition on this, over mass remained, mass retained times rising temperature. In case of some question that I'm form of experiment, this is the way you, would, you do that. So from both experiment, apparent expansion we call gamma A is also given in terms of experiment while as mass expelled over mass remained of time size. Mass expelled is the one that is given out. Mass remained is the one that is in the container. Then rising temperature is just theta two minus theta one or T two minus T one. I hope my student gets all these things. And this is the way you are expected to work to understand the concept of thermal expansivity. So in this slide, we talked about apparent expansion of liquid, comparing the what a container and the liquid. We said the liquid expand more than the container. And because liquid expand more than container, the difference in the coefficient of that of liquid minus that of the container will give us a kind of what overflow of volume. And that particular volume overflow is now related in terms of what that of what coefficient of what that of liquid minus that of the container. That definition is called apparent cubic expansion, which is what we discuss. And we said the apparent expansivity from experiment, we call all experiment or all experiment rather, that which is given by mass expelled over mass in the container times rising temperature. Numerically, all these formulas are very important for us to keep in mind. And we are going to be using, needing them in, words in future to solve some what tough questions later in the section. So now guys, uh, we talked about the last slide. I hope it is the last slide. Wow. I just hope it is the last slide. So the last slide. About the last slide now, we have illustrations. About the illustration, I'll only be giving you some logic on how to what, how to solve these questions without wasting time. So you guys are the one that works that will finish it with your calculator because I don't put calculator to solve questions. So now about this one. Before that, I think uh, there should be one more slide, maybe which was not mentioned. Maybe we should just talk about that with before we before we go into this. That is a bimetallic slide. I think I have talked about this in the checklist video before. You can watch that also, especially a level student, the bimetallic stripes. A bimetallic stripe is just a combination of two. Let's say we are once talking about the expansion of bimetallic stripe. It's important we talk about all concepts and we don't jump because of time. Like I said, when we talk about bimetallic stripe, it is just a combination of two metals that can expand. Majorly, we use aluminum and copper. So aluminum and copper, let me draw. I think I need to draw. I think I need to draw. So let's say we have this. I cannot walk. I just want to draw a line. I'm looking for shortcuts. I make me draw a line, but it's not going to work. Sometimes short cuts might not work. So this is it. We have this. We have this. We have this. We have this. We have two particular meta that are reverted. Reverted simply means they are being tight. So in it, there we have our uh, let's say we have our uh, aluminium. Aluminium is the first meta here because it expands more than copper. And we say we have as the second. Now they are being tied together. They are being reverted. Revert means uh, even if you apply it to them, they are not going to put, they are not, they are never going to be what we detach. They will always be with each other. The only thing that will happen to them is that but they will just bend in form of a half or a spectrum. So when it is supplied, let's say the initial length of this thing is the uh, initial length of both of them is L naught. That is the cap of separation. So when we supply it to them, we know 
when it is being supplied to them, there will be a change in what's temperature. So when we continue to eat this, temperature will increase from T to delta T, already to this course. So um, as we try to eat them, something will now happen. What will happen is what? Well, instead of these things to lose what? They will expand, but they will not break. They will still be together. So you are going to see something like an arc, like this. I hope students have come across this thing before. That is what you are going to see. So the first meta that is more is going to be at the back. Whereas the second meta will now go. Oh, wow, look at my look at my diagram for crying out loud. Very, very worst. Wow, not bent. So this is and just find something. So this is uh permit my diagram, my dear student. So this is the aluminium we now form something much mean aluminium is this. So the metal that expand more we be at the back because it expand more. Whereas the second metal which expand less, we come like this. So the reason is because aluminium expand more than copper. So you can use this simple cheat of uh, all agent conduct fee for increase in expansivity in case of questions. So when you see them like this, aluminum comes here and the copper comes here. So the length of aluminum will now be here. The length of copper will be at the back. So it forms now, you can now calculate the length, the final length of each one will be the initial length or not, to one plus alpha, that of change in what? Linear expansivity of uh, aluminum multiplied by change in temperature. This is for aluminum A. Uh, for the second one, L2 will be initial length, one plus alpha, that is for copper, change in temperature. So this is, in fact, in A level, we can also see that this thing will form something like a sector. So when it forms something like a sector, it has a sectoral angle, which we can use our knowledge of sector of theta over 360 times two pi r to get this. So get this at the back of your mind. The bimetallic stripe is just talking about the expansion of two particular substances which are revert or revited. When they are revited, it means they are being tightened. So when we eat them off, they will not break, they will still be together but they will only bend. The expansion will be something like what you have shown. And the way you know them is by what, which one is fine more, we come to the back and the other ones at the front. So students should be careful about that. I just need to talk about that before the illustration side. Now the illustration questions are just four. The first one we have here is a, a glass bottle of initial volume of two times 10 to power four centimeter cube is heated from 20 to 50. If the linear expansion of glass is this, the volume of the bottle at 50 degrees Celsius. I hope you can see that now, volume of the bottle. Now, <laughs> very funny. Now, you are given linear expans expansivity. So, cubic expansivity of volume expansion is three alpha. So, what you do there, I told you, I will just take you through three times uh, nine times 10 raised to power negative six. Please, the SI unit of linear expansion or expansivity is per Kelvin. You might face that also in some what, a multiple choice question. So you keep that at the back of your mind. So I won't say that you are looking for the, the volume of the bottle at 50 degrees Celsius. So you are looking for the new volume. So you know that final volume is equal to initial volume into bracket one plus alpha change or whatever. So you can just use that directly, initial volume into bracket one plus gamma change in temperature which we've talked. So initial volume is this. Now initial volume is two times 10 to the four, two times 10 is four, that is like 20,000. So you put that open bracket one plus gamma is the answer you are going to get here. 27 times 10 is plus which is 2.7 times 10 is a negative five per Kelvin. So substitute all parameter change in temperature is from 20 to 50. That is T2 minus T1. I hope students can do this. I told you I don't do Illustration for student again, I only put you through an hour to go about that. So 30 degree Celsius is what is the temperature of the 30. So 30, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 5 plus 1, multiplied by 2 times 10 to the minus 4, directly you are going to have 
one of these answers. So I hope students can do that and comment the answer in the, words, in the comment section. So the next question, question two, about question two, we have a meta cube of psi. You can see is the side of meta cube that is given. Literally about mensuration is tested here. Linear expansion, I'm talking about cube. Linear expansivity is moved from ice water mixture into boiling water. The increase in volume of the cube is that volume of a cube from your geometry from your mensuration class is the initial length raised to power three, the side raised to power three. In this case, it is five. To get five raised to power three, that is 125 centimeter cube. So that is V naught, which is your initial volume. So you are looking for the, the final volume, I guess. The increase in volume, oh, very good. Now, remember, increase in volume is tata. Excuse me, increase in volume is tata V, which we have talked about. So directly, if you are looking for delta V, you can just use the direct relationship, data V, that is increase in volume. You know, when I derive the formula of linear expansion for you, remember, we say the increase in length is equals to the old length, that is L naught, then change in what? Change in what? Change alpha, change in temperature. So if it is volume, it will be change in volume will be equals to the old volume, what is V naught, gamma change in temperature. If it is superficial, which is area, it will be the change in area, which is equals to old area, A naught, then beta change in what you have. Uh, this is change in temperature. So this is just in case of increase in volume means change in volume. So directly I can just say it is V naught gamma change in temperature. How about that? So which is very, very easy to work. Uh, to solve now. So directly, you know, from ice water, ice water, ice is a zero degree Celsius, water is what, 100 degrees Celsius. So this is just technicality that is there. Others are very easy. Delta V is what you are looking for. V naught is what you calculated, H125. Then gamma is, uh, you know, gamma is always three alpha. So gamma is equals to three alpha, which is three times two times 10 to power negative five. This is just six times 10 to power negative five per Kelvin. So which you multiply times six times 10 to power negative five times change in temperature is 100 minus zero, which is now 100. So doing that directly, you should have your answer from here. If you are following, this is very simple to understand. This is just six times six right there times six part two, six times six part three. So 125 times six will be around uh, 0.75, I guess, centimeter. You can do that with your calculator. It's just saying 125 times uh, 0 0.006. So we give you one of these answers and you put the answer in the comment section. So that is that on how to do that. And about the last set, which is the last two, Wow. Now we have a glass flask of volume of 1000, and that's the initial volume. You can always write parameter down. You can see that the topic is quite easy and direct. 1000 centimeter cube is filled with mercury, which is heated from, this is change in temperature, 30 to 80, T2 minus 51. If the cubic expansivity of mercury is, of glass and mercury are this and this, expressively, the apparent increase in volume is that you can see exactly what we talk about, apparent cubic expansivity. So it's kind, kind of very easy when you know concept. What do you do here? It's very simple. Get the increase in volume of this one, get the increase in volume of this one, and subtract. Another person will do its own directly. We know that uh, for the for glass, you say for glass, that is a uh, increase in volume of glass, if you, find of, uh, if you want to do it one by one, but if you want to do it together, you can just use a, uh, gamma this one minus gamma this one, then use the initial v naught. But for a beginner, some of that you are still beginner, you do for glass, you do for mercury, then you now subtract, that is apparent cubic expansion. But from what I've given to you, so which is like volume overflow, overflow here, will now be equals to, if you are very conversant with initial volume into brackets, gamma, now you can see, gamma, the liquid is in the glass, I guess. So gamma of glass, 
minus gamma of mercury, then changing what? Changing temperature. So which is what you know. So this is the apparent volume of the what? Of the container. So this is what we just do. Substitute parameter, V naught is 1,000. So we have V of G is, as you can see, 2.4 times 10 is power negative 4 minus R. Minus uh, 1.8 times 10 is power negative 4. Multiply by change in temperature, 80 minus 30 is 50. The rest is the answer. So whatever you get is the apparent temperature, which is like the volume overflow. So that is the essence of knowing concept. When you know concept, it is quite easy to get answer. So now I think you are going to get a negative value. Yes, okay, not a negative, or oh, a negative value, which shows the temperature has reduced. So now the next one is uh, the last question, but not the least under this chapter of thermal expansion. A constant volume gas thermometer indicates a pressure of 250 mmHg at ice point and 750 at steam point. The temperature on the thermometer indicates a pressure of 415 millimeter of mercury. That's pressure thermometer. The thermodynamic scale units we use, we remember we are looking for the temperature of that is always theta minus zero because we are talking about ice point over. 100. So it's theta minus over 100 directly equals to the initial temperature. Uh, the initial pressure is 450 minus the ice point, or the ice point, 250 divided by, you can finish this, uh, the steam point is 750 minus 450 minus 250. So this is it. I have used the standard word where we use or we measure what temperature scale formula, which we have discussed in the concept. So the rest is story. You finish this one and write the answer. It's very easy to know the answer even with our pressing calculator. So I hope students, you are what you understand the concept of thermal expansions of liquids and uh, thermal expansion generally. And as a result of that, we have done one or two simple, simple questions about the full questions of details questions and top questions. You can join the full course program on our telegram page. So guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed the class. This is all about thermal expansion and this is all what you need to know. Don't forget to subscribe and like the channel. See you guys soon. You have a wonderful time. Thank you and God bless.